Houston, we have a problem. This is Bryce Massengill. This is H-Town. And this is the Liberty Root Podcast. And this is the 10th day of January 2018. And it's also that time in the year where all those New Year's resolutions are just a faint memory of nine days ago. I mean, honestly, am am I wrong about that? Everybody sets these New Year's resolutions, but how many actually stick to them? If anything, my pant size goes up a few sizes because I'm indulging in all the food leftovers after the holidays. But anyways, I hope you guys had a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I know that I sure was spoiled by my wife Deanna and our little dog, Abby. They always treat me good. And as much as it was good to be away from the podcast for a holiday break, you know, I I was getting a little podcast cabin fever. I was going a little stir-crazy at at home, just uh, staring at the 10th on the calendar and, and being excited that I could... Finally, again, when that day comes, sit behind this microphone and bring you this podcast. So it's it's good to be back, and I'm excited to be starting a brand new year with you. We have a lot to cover on today's podcast, and you know I'm really excited to see what uh, 2018 has to bring um, each and every one of us. So I'm really looking forward to to that. Now I want to begin today's podcast by asking you just a very simple question. Are you one that likes to follow the rules or are you somebody who likes to rebel, that being for attention or what have you? And that leads me into talking about businesses. Now businesses have rules and regulations for their employees and customers alike. Sometimes they're plastered on posters when you walk in a storefront and sometimes they're in the break room for employees to abide by. I mean, one of the most famous signs that you see, I mean, come on, say it along with me, is no shoes, no shirt, no service, which is also turned into a fantastic country song. But I also believe that there is innate rules and innate regulations that sometimes don't get put on a piece of paper and scotch tape to a window or tacked to a corkboard of a break room. And we live in a country where capitalism is probably the best thing since sliced bread. We live in a country who allows you to open a business of your choice and run your business how you see fit to employ people and to bring in as much profit as you possibly can. That's part of the structure of a business. Help others help yourself. And besides all those rules and regulations that are posted throughout a particular store, there's also a way of running business based off of your personal convictions and principles. You have Christians, you have Jews, you have atheists, you have agnostics, you have Buddhists, you have Hindus, you have gays, you have straights, you have trans, you have all the other letters of the alphabet type people. And each one of those that I just named is in America entitled to run a business exactly how they see fit. If they choose one thing one day, that I want to put roast beef on the menu, and then tomorrow I don't, you can have a riot in the streets if you had the best roast beef in town and for some reason decided to stop selling it, but that is your right as the store owner to pull something off the menu because it's your business. You have the authority to make those types of decisions. I mean, do you think every business across America has a no shirt, no shoes, no service sign in their front window? Of course not. But that doesn't mean that if somebody comes running through buck naked, that they're not going to kick them out. You know they're going to kick them out. If they're in their right mind, they're going to kick them out regardless of if there's a sign there or not. It's an innate rule and regulation that is in place. So, what's in our First Amendment? The right to speech, assembly, press, and religion. First Amendment in our Constitution. First Amendment. The start of our amendments. The first states those things. 
And you hear these people who are so upset and so hurt about our Constitution and how it needs to evolve and change. Well, it's not a very good start if you start with the First Amendment. Don't you think you want to start high and work your way back to the First? But right off the bat there, the First Amendment, it means nothing anymore in this country. It means garbage. Your garbage is worth more than the First Amendment in this country anymore, apparently. Because let me read you this crazy story. It's been in the news, but a settlement has finally come down, and it's something that, oh well, you all need to hear. Do you remember the name Aaron and Melissa Klein from five years ago? Well, they're the couple from Portland, Oregon, who own Sweet Cakes Bakery, and they were the ones to refuse service to two lesbians. Well, a U.S. Court of Appeals dealt religious freedom Another blow last week as it upheld a penalty against Christian bakers Aaron and Melissa Klein for declining to create a wedding cake for two lesbians almost five years ago. Lawyers for the Kleins said State Labor Commissioner Brad Avakin and the State Bureau of Labor and Industries violated the Kleins' rights as artists to free speech, their rights to religious freedom, and their rights as defendants to a due process. Avakin had ordered the owners of the now-closed Sweet Cakes by Melissa to pay emotional distress damages of $135,000 to the lesbians. The Oregon Court of Appeals sided with the state last week. The Washington Post reports saying the clients failed to show the state targeted them for their religious beliefs. Really? The court said the Klein's argument that their cakes are an artistic expression is entitled to be taken seriously, but it's not enough for the couple to assert their cakes constitute art. They must show that others perceive their creations like a sculpture or a painting. We accept that the Klein's imbue each wedding cake in their own aesthetic choices, the judge said. They have made no showing that other people will necessarily experience any wedding cake that the Klein's create predominantly as expression rather than as food. First Liberty Institute, the legal group that is representing the Klein's, criticized the ruling. And they stated, The Oregon Court of Appeals decided that Aaron and Melissa Klein are not entitled to the Constitutional's promises of religious liberty and free speech, said First Liberty President Kelly Shackelford. In a diverse and polarizing society, people have goodwill and should be able to peacefully coexist with different beliefs. Avakin had told local media around the time of 2015's find that the goal is for rehabilitation. For those who do violate the law, we want them to learn from that experience and have a good, successful business in Oregon. Avakin had also modified the proposed order from the administrative law judge he appointed to include a condition ordering that the clients not to speak publicly about not wanting to bake cakes for same-sex weddings based on their Christian beliefs. And here's what's fascinating about when all this took place in uh, 2013. The Kleins declined to bake a cake to Rachel Bowman and her same-sex partner based upon their religious convictions. The lesbians subsequently filed a complaint with Oregon's Bureau of Labor and Industries, alleging discrimination on the part of the suburban Portland bakers on the basis of sexual orientation, despite same-sex marriage wasn't even legal in Oregon, until 2014. But the state was so crafty, and they determined that the Kleins have violated a 2007 Oregon law protecting the rights of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transgender people in employment, housing, and public accommodations. The law provides an exemption for religious organizations, but does not allow private businesses to discriminate based on sexual orientation. And here's what's crazy about this whole thing. It wasn't the first time that the Kleins have served Bowman and her partner in the past. But their specific request for a gay wedding cake? They could not do that because of their religious convictions. And the outcome is, well, they had to pay $135,000 because of emotional damages that was caused. And it ultimately put them out of business. Ooh, and, and I'm sure here was one of the buzzwords that the uh, lesbian couple used in court because they, they said this over and over, that they felt that they were mentally raped by the Kleins. But the cupcakes that they ordered previously, just out of 
I guess, just hunger for cupcakes. And they were served. You know, they had no problem with that. They were they were not raped that day. But the day that they came in and they didn't like their Christian beliefs and the fact that they didn't serve them exactly what they wanted, they believed that they were mentally raped and they were ultimately severely damaged. And the damage was worth $135,000. And I just bear the question, was it emotion or mental rape or was it the fact that they could get a pretty sweet payday because the state of Oregon has thousands of bakeries and if you want to narrow it down to just places that make cakes alone there are hundreds throughout the state of Oregon I've looked it up but instead of going to one of those who I'm sure one of them would have happily served them, especially being in the state of Oregon, probably more than not would be willing to serve them. But because the client refused and hurt their feelings, ultimately having them lose a business that they've worked so hard for because of their Christian beliefs and personal convictions, something that is protected by the first amendment in our constitution and the fact that this wasn't even a state law on the books when this thing took place you see i'm all for individual rights and freedoms i'm for the freedom and individual rights of homosexual couples who decide that they love one another that's their individual right to be together in my personal opinion but it's also the individual's right, in this case the Kleins or any business owner across the country. It's also their right to review, refuse service if it goes against their principles and convictions. You see, you hear people lump this in with racism. You know, these people, you know, can you imagine if they refused to serve if, if they were black? That's a different story, though. This isn't that situation. Because Christianity doesn't have anything against blacks. But Christianity preaches that you need to love homosexuals. But you don't live that lifestyle and you don't endorse that lifestyle. And just like you can't expect the Christian bakers to tell the homosexual lesbian couple that they have no right to live a life that they want to live. Just the same that the lesbian couple has no right to tell the Christian couple how they should run their business. You see, it goes both ways, but people don't like to see it as a two-way street. They think that we should all be on the same playing field. We should all believe the same thing. But what makes America great is the individualistic mindset of each individual citizen of these great United States of America. You see, they want you to believe in all this hope and change, but only if you hope for what they want changed. This story just goes to show you that the freedom you're born with in this country is something that can now be so quickly taken away. In just a matter of hurt feelings or an unconstitutional court. So never take your freedom for granted. Because tomorrow, well, you just may not have it. Back in a minute. Hello, it's Bryce here from Liberty Root, and have you missed one of our past podcasts and just wondering exactly where to go to find them? Well, now it's easier than ever. 
go to youtube.com and in the search bar type in Liberty Root Podcast and you can find all of our past episodes that we've done. Also there, you can find every episode of our Heroes in History series. So, that is youtube.com in the search bar. You need to type in Liberty Root Podcast and you can listen until your little heart is content. Everywhere. It sounds like a Beatles song, I know. But this song title could also be used as the slogan in Germany as refugees are causing major problems across the country. I mean, I remember saying I told you so about a year or so ago when Germany thought it was a good idea to be nice and just let whoever and their brothers inside their border. Well, Obama's sister from another mother, also known as Angela Merkel, Germany's chancellor, is now beginning to think maybe this wasn't such a good idea. And it's getting so bad in Germany that the liberal mainstream media can no longer ignore it. A new report shows that migrants are almost solely responsible for the country's huge rise in violent crimes. Hmm. A new report released last week blamed refugees for the 10% increase in violent crimes between 2015 and 2016. The report that came out, it was government-sponsored, and it said that 90% of the 10-point increase in violent crimes came from refugees. The migrants that were responsible for the jump in violent crimes were between the ages of 14 and 30. And even though Angela Merkel was an idiot and put her whole country at risk for this particular thing to happen, you would think that they would realize that they needed to do something drastically. I guess it's always better late than never, even though it's slightly too late because of the thousands of refugees, predominantly male refugees, who are living in the country. But she thinks... And the other delegates to Congress over in Deutschland think that it's the best thing to reduce these crimes by reuniting refugees with their family and allow them, too, to come to Germany to help reduce such violence. Because currently in Germany, it's of the refugees who've came into the country, like I said, they're predominantly young males. These males came across the border, leaving their partners, mothers, sisters, and all other females behind. You think there's a larger agenda to this influx in refugees? Nah, it can't be. I mean, it's not very difficult to understand why these women avoid migrating to Germany. I mean, for New Year's Eve this year... Germany and the authorities had to install rape-free zones for the New Year's Eve celebrations. They had to do this because there has been multiple sexual attacks and rapes that have been linked directly to the migrants who have come to the country between 15, 16, and the first part of 17. And here's what's so crazy about it. Listen to this stat. Documents that were leaked in 2016, showed that approximately 2,000 men, many, if not most, whom were newly arrived migrants from the Middle East and North Africa, sexually assaulted, now hear this, sexually assaulted more than 1,200 women during the celebrations in several German cities. That was the first time in German history where multiple women were raped and sexually abused during a New Year's Eve celebration. What is directly corresponding with that is the influx of immigrants. Now what's a result of that? Increased security, higher taxes to pay for the security. I mean, all sorts of other things that go into it. All because you felt pressured 
by these liberals. You just felt pressure, so you folded. And now your country is changed forever. It's sad to say, Germany, but maybe because of your government, your New Year's resolution this year should be setting up a budget fund to invest in brass knuckles, pepper spray, and rape whistles. It's sad to say, but I do believe that this is the beginning of a new European Islamic state. So Germany, auf Wiedersehen, auf Wiedersehen, auf Wiedersehen. Back in a minute. I'm just going through and looking through some of these pictures of that crazy Arctic storm that came through the East Coast um, last week and impacted, you know, flights. I think I heard like 4,300 flights or something last Thursday were canceled or something like that. It's unbelievable to see the photos because they also had a high tide and it was the second highest tide in Boston Harbor history. And when the tide hit from, from the ocean... The temperature with the wind chill in Boston was minus 23 degrees. So that water came over the banks onto the streets. Downtown Boston, I don't know if you've ever been there, but you have this old state house in the middle. It reached all the way around the old state house. And then as soon as the water became stagnant, it instantly froze. And it froze everything that it surrounded. I mean, it, it was literally feet of ice that had formed because of the uh, storm surge that came over because of that that Arctic storm. It, and some of these pictures, I mean, it's it's terrible that they had to go through this because, I mean, there was powder out, power outages all across the town, you know, multiple injuries. I haven't heard of any deaths related to it. But some of the pictures that are coming out of this is or it's beautiful. It looks like something that comes out of, like, a, a Christmas movie or... Or a horror film, I guess, if you live on the East Coast. But it's just unbelievable. I mean, all the the ice. I've never seen anything anything quite like it. So I just thought I'd add that in there. And that's they posted those on abc.com. And I'm sure if you just search for, I think it's Boston Winter Storm, there's about 14 to 20 pictures that are just incredible. So anyway, since this is the first podcast in the new year of 2018, I thought it would be interesting to look back on some of the top 10 biggest news stories of 2017. A whole bunch of people got together, apparently, I don't know how they determined this, and they compiled the top 10 biggest news stories of 2017, and I'm just going to quickly read through those, and then we'll head into this week's Heroes in History. As the new year is here, it seems like every year is dubbed a year like no other, but 2017 truly was more dramatic than many others in recent memory. In the 12 months of 2017, we faced a renewed threat of nuclear war, debated whether to take a knee during the national anthem, and resisted the temptation to look at the sun during the total solar eclipse. From increased tension with North Korea to hurricane season unlike any other that we have ever seen, to the bombshell allegations of sexual misconduct in Hollywood and beyond. These are the top 10 stories of 2017. The New President Donald Trump was sworn in as the 45th president of the United States on January 20th, outlining his vision of a new national populism and reiterating the same America First mantra that delivered him the White House during the 2016 election. In his first address as leader of the free world, Trump said in his inauguration would signify a historic moment when the forgotten men and women of our country would be forgotten no longer. Story number two. The Mueller Investigation 
Bowing to public and congressional pressure, Deputy U.S. Attorney General Rod Rosenstein appointed for former FBI Director Robert Mueller in May as a special counsel to conduct the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential campaign. More than five months later, Mueller's office indicted President Donald Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his longtime business associate, Rick Gates, on 12 charges including money laundering, being an unregistered foreign agent, and seven counts of failure to file reports of foreign bank and financial accounts. The special counsel's office also announced that day that it had struck a cooperation agreement with former Trump advisor George Papadopoulos, who secretly pleaded guilty to lying to federal agents about his contacts with the Kremlin-connected Russia. In early December, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty in federal court to making false statements to FBI about his contact with Russia and agreed to cooperate with the Mueller probe. The special counsel's investigation is currently still ongoing. Story 3. Greater Tensions with North Korea American tensions with North Korea intensified rapidly since President Donald Trump was inaugurated in late January, as leader Kim Jong-un made no secret that his scientists are working on a nuclear-tipped missile capable of reaching the United States. Kim M. Rong, North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations, bluntly warned that the Trump administration's tough talk was creating a dangerous situation in which thermonuclear war may break out at any moment. The situation has become so dire that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson asked China's Pyongyang's neighbor, the most powerful ally, to use their influence to convince or compel North Korea to rethink its strategic calculus. Tensions then escalated in June when Otto Warmbier, a 22-year-old American student, died days after being released from North Korean prison in an unconscious state. The regime's actions had led Trump and his administration to ratchet up the rhetoric, with the president in August promising fire and fury like the world has never seen. If North Korea continues to threaten the U.S., Trump also disparages North Korean leader as Little Rocket Man during his first address to the United Nations. Number 4. The Hashtag Me Too Movement In early October, back-to-back bombshell reports in the New York Times and the New Yorker revealed that Harvey Weinstein allegedly lured women into his hotel rooms, bars, and sexually harassed them or assaulted them in what some have described as an open secret that was known for years in Hollywood. Later that month, after a tweet from actress Elisa Milano, who was one of Weinstein's accusers, social media was inundated with personal stories of being the victims of sexual harassment or assault, all using the hashtag MeToo. Weinstein's downfall has seemingly emboldened others to come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against prominent men. In recent months alone, at least 30 powerful men in entertainment, business, politics, and in the news media have been publicly condemned for their alleged sexual misconduct, and many have lost their jobs as a result, including Weinstein. The silence breakers of the hashtag MeToo movement, who also gave voice to sexual assault and harassment survivors, have since been named Times Magazine's 2017 Persons of the Year. Number 5. The Massacres in Las Vegas and Texas On October 1st, a lone gunman unleashed a rapid-fire barrage of bullets down on a crowd of concert goers from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in Las Vegas, killing 59 people and injuring more than 500 others. It was the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. The shooter, who was a 64-year-old of Mesquite, Nevada, acted alone, police said. Investigators found 23 firearms in his room at the Mandalay Bay and 19 more at his home. He was found after killing himself with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. This investigation is ongoing. And on November 5th, an armored-clad shooter entered a church in rural Texas and opened fire, killing 26 people and injuring at least 19 others. The gunman fired at least the first shots outside of the church before unleashing more bullets inside the church. His victims' ages ranged between 5 and 72 years old. Police said that the shooter was then later found dead inside his vehicle after a good Samaritan stepped in. Number 6. Terrorism in Popular Tourist Destinations Vehicular and suicide terrorist attacks hit some of Europe's most 
popular tourist destinations, as well as America's most populous cities this year. In late March, three people were killed and about 40 were injured when an attacker rammed into pedestrians on London's Westminster Bridge and attempted to enter Parliament welding a knife. About two weeks later, an attacker killed four and injured 15 after intentionally driving his department store truck in Stockholm, Sweden. In May, children were among the 22 killed in a suicide bombing after an Ariana Grande concert at Britain's Manchester Arena. It was the deadliest terror attack in Britain since 2005. Almost two weeks later, seven people died and nearly 50 were injured when a vehicle rammed into pedestrians on the London Bridge, and three attackers embarked on a stabbing spree at nearby Borough Market. During August, 13 people were killed and more than 100 were wounded in Spain when a van plowed into Barcelona's La Rambla tourist destination before another car hit several people and killed one woman in a resort further down the Spanish coast. Then, terrorism again hit the U.S. on October 31st when a terrorist rented a pickup truck and deliberately mowed down pedestrians on a bike path in Lower Manhattan, killing eight and injuring about a dozen more before crashing into a school bus. Officials said the terrorist attack was the deadliest in New York City since September 11th, 2001. Number 7. The Opioid Epidemic In August, President Trump declared America's opioid epidemic a national emergency, two days after vowing the U.S. would win the fight against it. About a month earlier, the Department of Justice charged more than 400 people who officials said were preying on addicts to shell out money for unnecessary treatments that only worsened their conditions in doctors who were allegedly prescribing unnecessary opioids. The White House Council of Economic Advisors recently reported that the epidemic's true cost in 2015 was $504 billion, more than six times the most recent estimate. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced in late October that illegal lab-made fentanyl contributed to the death of at least half of fatal opioid overdoses in 2016, underscoring how deadly the epidemic has become in recent years. Number 8. The Devastating Hurricane Season a hurricane season unlike any other came to a close in December after causing billions of dollars in damages and devastating those who were impacted by Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria when they plowed through southeast Texas, Florida, and the Caribbean. Harvey, a Category 3 storm drenched southeast Texas in late August with 1 million gallons of water per person in the region, according to the Associated Press. The storm caused historic flooding in Houston, where some downtown areas were knee-deep in water and portions of highways were shut down with 10 feet of water. Less than two weeks later, Hurricane Irma ravaged Florida, devastating the Florida Keys as a Category 4 storm before weakening. The storm also led to the deaths of 12 patients at Hollywood, Florida's nursing home. Those fatalities have since been ruled a homicide, officials said. And at the end of September, the Category 4 Hurricane Maria, the strongest storm to hit Puerto Rico in almost a century, steamrolled through the island, annihilating homes, knocking out entire power grids, and leaving many without electricity for months. Maria's aftermath also raised concerns about the relationship between the Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke and the small Montana energy firm that was helping Puerto Rico rebuild its power grid, Whitefish Energy Holdings. Puerto Rico canceled its $300 million contract with the company in October after the Washington Post reported, among other things, that the company only had two full-time employees when the storm made landfall. Number 9. The Total Solar Eclipse The astronomical phenomenon of the century lived up to the hype. The total solar eclipse shifted across the U.S. in late August, enchanting Americans in small towns and large stadiums from coast to coast. The nation was captivated by the first total solar eclipse to cross the U.S. since 1918. Viewers gazed at the eclipse as it carved a narrow path of totality from Salem, Oregon to Charleston, South Carolina. One of the rules was not to look directly at the eclipse, but, but through special sunglasses or projected reflections. But some, including the president, disregarded that sound advice. Number 10. The Culture Wars Since President Trump took office, the partisan division that evidenced on the campaign trail translated into national culture wars, including debates over the merits of removing statues and building names that honored Confederate soldiers, as well as kneeling at football games to protest supposed racial inequality. 
On August 12th, white nationalists gathered in Emancipation Park in Charlottesville, Virginia, before a rally organized by a group known as Unite the Right. The rally's purpose was to protest the removal of the statue honoring Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Later that day, a 32-year-old woman was killed and more than 19 others were injured after a car rammed into a group of counter-protesters who were demonstrating against the alt-right. In early October, Vice President Mike Pence attended a San Francisco 49ers game in Indianapolis only to walk out after some of the team's players knelt during the Star Spangled Banner. After the fallout, Trump said days later that the NFL should have suspended former San Francisco's 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who was the first to take a knee during the national anthem to protest, like I said, supposed racial injustice justice in the United States. And this was a year in review of the top 10 stories from 2017. Back in a minute. Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born November 30, 1835 in the village of Florida, Missouri. People today know the great storyteller as Mark Twain. Twain has always been able to capture an audience and take them for a great adventure. He was able to portray human behavior in a fascinating way. Much of Twain's vibrant imagination simply came from observations of everyday life, and many of those observations were observed in a town called Hannibal on the banks of the Mississippi River. And this is where this week's Heroes in History begins. Clemens was 11 years old when his father passed away. His father was the sole wage earner of the family, so without his weekly checks coming in, it would render Twain and his family helpless. So he went to work. He took on all sorts of different jobs like store clerk, delivery boy. He also began work as an apprentice and a compositor with the local printers and would contribute to small pieces in the local newspaper. From a very young age, Clemens loved to illustrate, and when he was 17, one of his comic sketches was published by a sportsman's magazine in Boston. Beginning in 1853, Clemens began traveling as a journeyman printer. He went to places like St. Louis, Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. To say Clemens carried a few jobs is, well, an understatement. It seems as though he tried his hand in just about every career field imaginable from sales clerk, printer, illustrator, steamboat pilot, running timber mills, and silver mining. But at the end of the day, there was nothing better to him than putting pen to paper. Clemens eventually moved to California, and while there, he adopted the name that we all know today, Mark Twain. The name derived from a river man's term for water that's just safe enough for navigation. In 1865, Twain took a job with the Sacramento Union newspaper, and eventually he was working for Alta, California. His job was to travel all over and write about what he encountered, a dream job that many envied. In 1870, Twain took up part ownership and became a contributing editor to the Buffalo Express in New York. And while in New York, that's where he met his bride, Olivia Langdon. He and Olivia then moved to Hartford, Connecticut, where they would remain for 23 years, and they had three daughters together. Writing and editorial work was never in short supply for Twain. Newspapers and journals from all over the world were reaching out. They knew how well-rounded he was in travel and, well, just life in general. Mark Twain's creativeness and vibrant depictions all come from experiences he's come across in his personal life. Like his article entitled Life on the Mississippi, he was able to capture the beauty of what he saw as a steamboat pilot. He had a way of making the reader feel as though they were there too. He made you see the beauty he saw, experience the danger that he went through, and grasp the surreal feeling that you were actually thrusted into being one of the characters in one of his stories. Mark Twain lived out his boyhood memories with stories such as The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Readers young and old would be sucked into the adventure. Schools across the country started circulating it, and thousands of book reports were turned in. Twain was able to show triumph like never before, 
in pain that seemed at the time to grab you from within the pages. Mark Twain went on to publish many stories, each and every one relating somehow to a personal experience. Unfortunately, as Twain grew older, the reflections of simpler times started to fade. Some of the views he carried up until his death in 1910 left many puzzled and confused, such as his bizarre stance on religion and political worldviews. But Twain is a hero in history from what he brought to life on paper, making characters and illustrations that relate to us all in a personal way. Painting pictures that brought us into the story. Some will just simply plaster words on paper, but Twain created adventures and journeys that it leaped out of the pages and played out in front of us all to enjoy. Did I ever tell you what the definition of insanity is? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Liberty Root Podcast, and this is the segment that gets me excited as a giddy little schoolgirl. I love this segment so much, and it's what's trending in the news this week. The reason I love this segment so much is because everything else in the podcast is kind of planned out and structured, but I literally get these stories moments before I start recording, so that's why I just love this segment so much. So this is what's trending in the news this week. Number one, the world's most expensive bottle of vodka is stolen from a Copenhagen bar. Danish police are investigating a theft that was claimed to be the world's most expensive bottle of vodka in the world. A bar owner says it could be an inside job. The bottle made from white and yellow gold containing diamond and it had the replica of the Russian Imperial Eagle on its cap. Get this, this bottle of vodka is said to be worth $1.3 million. A CCTV recording sent to AFP shows a masked man grabbing the vodka bottle and fleeing Cafe 33 Bar in Copenhagen early on Tuesday. Somebody must have gotten the key from someone who previously worked here, Brian Emberg, owner of the bar, told AFP. The bottle, which was featured in the political thriller House of Cards, was not insured, and it was loaned from a Russian businessman. The bottle was served to the American president, played by actor Kevin Spacey, in season three of the Netflix show. Copenhagen police said that no suspect has been caught. And that is story number one. Story number two takes us to Mexico, where this man can make us all breathe a little easier. Hovering over his tarot cards and holding a microphone to his wizard-like beard, Mexican psychic Antonio Vasquez on Thursday said there was no need to fear a nuclear war between the United States and North Korea. Better known as El Brujo Mayor, he is famous in Mexico for his predictions at the start of the year on subjects ranging from politics to celebrities and sports. No need to fear that 2018 will see a clash of egos between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korea leader Kim Jong-un to escalate into any nuclear war, he said. Night of swords. No bombs will fly. They will reach an agreement. And while that is good news, he goes on to crush the spirits of pop fans all around the world. He said there is no such good fortune for Columbia pop star Shakira, who recently had to suspend a world tour after a vocal cord injury. I sense someone has cast a spell on her, he said with a worried look, and I don't think she'll recover. El Mayor also went on to predict the upcoming 2018 World Cup in Russia. He thinks the defending champions Germany will defeat Spain in the finals. But after all these wonderful predictions, I don't know how much weight any of them actually hold. Because in 2016, he predicted that Donald Trump would lose the Republican primary election and that El Chapo would be killed and Maduro forced from power. And that is story number two. Story number three takes us to Oklahoma City. He came, he saw, and he stole an ungodly amount of beef jerky. Oklahoma City police are searching for a man who allegedly stole over $400 in beef jerky from a convenience store earlier this month. He had no weapon, and he wanted no cash, just the heavenly little beefy treat. But with some good high-definition cameras in the convenience store, they were able to get a good look 
at this beef bandit's face. And they said that it won't take very long to find and properly identify him. In the surveillance photos, the suspected thief wears a black Adidas sweatshirt and blue jeans. It was not immediately clear how the suspect was able to carry all that beef jerky out of the store without being caught or, well, why he stole that much jerky in the first place. But if you happen to see him out on the street, make sure to call the police, but first, ask for a few strips of beef jerky. And those are this week's top three trending stories in the news this week. I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Woke up to go give me a cold pop. Then I thought somebody was barbecuing. 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 I said, Oh Lord Jesus, it's a fire. Then I ran out. I didn't grab no shoes or nothing. Jesus, I ran for my life. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. You're listening to the Liberty Root Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast where we find ourselves at the finish line. I want to thank each and every one of you guys for uh, listening tonight and every week you know, I just have a feeling that 2018 is going to be our best year ever I want to fin- finish the podcast with reading you something that I wrote and it was something that I wrote a few days ago um, thinking about going into to 2018 and I'm going to share that with you another year has come and gone And now we move to the next. We can't change the things of the past, but we can change with the times that we have left. This year we will move forward more stronger and true. Put the focus on others and not just on you. Learn to give love and care like never before. Be the change you want to see in the world and watch that change soar. It won't come easy, and it won't come overnight. It won't lie down in front of you, it'll surely put up a fight. But if we face this year with honesty, perseverance, and truth, I sit here tonight and tell you that there isn't anything that we can't do. Have a good night, and as always, live life restore liberty and pursue happiness this has been a liberty root production 